Hello and welcome to our video summarizing all you need to know about the novel Beloved by Toni Morrison. My name is Barney and in this video we will look at Beloved, specifically beginning with some context related to the author Toni Morrison, as well as ideas at the time this novel was written that you will need to be aware of. We will then look into the novel's plot in detail and examine the necessary information you will need to know about it before looking at each character in the novel in depth, key themes related to the novel, as well as important symbols. This video is really useful, especially if you're studying Beloved as part of your English coursework or exams, as we will go into the details you will need to know to get top marks. So let's get started. Overview Beloved, a novel by Toni Morrison, published in 1987, was the winner of the 1988 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. The work examines the destructive legacy of slavery as it chronicles the life of a black woman named Seth from her pre-Civil War days as a slave in Kentucky to her time in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1873. Although Seth lives there as a free woman, she is held prisoner by memories of the trauma of her life as a slave. It was adapted during 1998 into a movie of the same name starring Oprah Winfrey. A New York Times survey of writers and literary critics ranked it the best work of American fiction from 1981 to 2006. The book's dedication reads, 60 million and more, referring to the Africans and their descendants who died as a result of the Atlantic slave trade. Moving on to plot summary. The novel is based on the true story of a black slave woman, Margaret Garner, who in 1856 escaped from a Kentucky plantation with her husband, Robert, and their children. They sought refuge in Ohio, but their owner and law officers soon caught up with the family. Before their recapture, Margaret killed her young daughter to prevent her return to slavery. In the novel, Seth is also a passionately devoted mother who flees with their children from an abusive owner known as school teacher. They are caught, and in an, in an act of supreme love and sacrifice, she too tries to kill her children to keep them from slavery. Only her two-year-old daughter dies, and the school teacher, believing that Seth is crazy, decides not to take her back. Seth later has beloved inscribed on her daughter's tombstone. Although she had intended for it to read, Dearly Beloved, she did not have the energy to pay for two words, as each word cost her 10 minutes of sex with the engraver. These events are revealed in flashbacks as the novel opens in 1873, with Seth and her teenage daughter, Denver, living in Ohio, where their house at 124 Bluestone Road is haunted by the angry ghost of the child Seth killed. The hauntings are alleviated by the arrival of Paul D., a man so ravaged by his slave past that he keeps his feelings in the tobacco bin of his heart. He worked on the same plantation as Seth, and the two begin a relationship. A brief period of relative calm ends with the appearance of a young woman who says that her name is Beloved. She knows things that suggest she is a reincarnation of Seth's lost daughter. Seth is obsessed with assuaging her guilt and tries to placate the increasingly demanding and manipulative Beloved. At one point, Beloved seduces Paul D. After learning that Seth killed her daughter, he leaves. The situation at 124 Bluestone worsens as Seth loses her job and becomes completely fixated on Beloved, who is soon revealed to be pregnant. While the lonely and largely housebound Denver initially befriends Beloved, she begins to grow concerned. She finally dares to venture outside in order to ask the community for help, and she is given food and she is given food and a job. As the local women attempt to stage an exorcism, Denver's employer arrives to take her to work and Seth mistakes him for school teacher and tries to attack him with an ice pick. The other women restrain her and during the commotion, Beloved disappears. Paul D later returns to the grieving Seth, promising to take care for her and Denver continues to thrive in the outside world. Moving on to a detailed summary of each chapter. Part 1 Chapter 1 The novel opens in 1873 in Cincinnati, Ohio. For the past 18 years, Seth, an ex-slave, and her daughter, Denver, have been living in a house that is haunted by the ghost of Seth's firstborn baby daughter. A 
until eight years ago, Seth's mother-in-law, Baby Suggs, also lived with them in their house at 124 Bluestone Road. Before she died, Baby Suggs sank into a deep depression, exhausted by a life of slavery and by the loss of all eight of her children. She spent her last days requesting colour, bits of brightly coloured objects she hoped would alleviate her sadness. Her death came only a short while after Seth's sons, Howard and Bugler, each ran away from 124 following encounters with their dead sister's ghost. Seth works hard to remember as little as possible about her past, and the memory of her sons is fading quickly. Most of her painful memories involve Sweet Home, a plantation in Kentucky where she lived as a slave until her escape 18 years ago. On this day, however, she returns home and finds an unexpected and surprising guest, Paul D. Paul D. was one of the five men who were Seth's fellow slaves at Sweet Home. These then included Paul A, Paul F, Sixo, and Seth's husband, Hale. Although Seth hasn't seen Paul D. in 18 years, they slip into easy conversation and Seth invites him inside. Paul D. walks into a pool of eerie red light and feels a wave of grief come over him. Seth explains that the present is a sad spectre of a dead baby, whose throat was cut before it was two years old. At her daughter, daughter's funeral, Seth mistook the preacher's reference to the dearly beloved mourners for a reference to her dead daughter. Afterwards, she agreed to ten minutes of sex with an engraver in order to have the word beloved carved on the baby's headstone. Paul D. has desired Seth ever since she arrived at Sweet Home at the age of 13 to replace Baby Suggs. Baby Suggs left because her son Hale had bought her freedom with five years of weekend labour. Seth was beautiful then, and the five male sweet home slaves waited in agonizing sexual frustration, having sex with calves and dreaming of rape, while she took a year to make her choice among them. She chose her, and together they had two sons and a daughter. Seth was pregnant with a fourth child, Denver, when the family made its escape from sweet home. Seth and Hal were separated during their escape. However, and neither Paul D nor Seth knows what happened to Hal. Seeing her mother flirting and talking about Sweet Home with Paul D makes Denver feel very lonely and excluded. She reacts with surly jealousy and dissolves into tears at the dinner table one evening. She cries that she cannot stay in the house because the community knows it to be haunted. Consequently, everyone avoids Denver and she has no friends. When Paul D wonders aloud why they haven't moved from 124, Seth firmly asserts that she will never run away from anything again. Later, Seth explains that she was whipped before she ran from Sweet Home to meet Baby Suggs and her children, whom she had sent ahead in Cincinnati. The white girl who helped deliver Denver said the resulting scars looked like a choke cherry tree. Seth cries and says that the men who beat her stole her baby's milk before she ran. Paul D comes up behind her and pulls down the top of her dress. He cradles her breasts in his hands while he kisses each line of her scars. The house immediately begins to lurch and shake as the ghost vents its rage. Baldy shouts and fights with the ghost, chasing it away. Denver resents Baldy's act. The ghost was the only company she had. Chapter 2 After 25 years of fantasizing about Seth, Baldy finds the consummation of his desire to be a disappointment. He lies awake in Seth's bed and decides that her tree is nothing but an ugly clump of scars. His thoughts turn to seek so a fellow slave at Sweet Home, who would walk 30 miles to meet his girlfriend, while Hell and Paul brothers find a way after Seth. We learn that although Baby Suggs had eight children by six different men, Hell, her youngest, was the only one who wasn't taken away from her. When Hell bought Baby Suggs her freedom, she believed that at her age, she was too old for her freedom to mean anything. Paul D's interested gaze reminds Seth of Hell whose love was more like that of a brother than that of a man laying claim. Seth remembers that when she and Hal first decided to get married, she asked Mrs. Garner if they were to have a wedding, but the white woman only laughed. With nothing to make the partnership official in any way, Seth secretly stitched herself a dress to mark the occasion. The lovers consummated their relationship in a cornfield, and the swaying corn stalks alerted the other men and the Seth that Seth had finally made her choice. That night, the other sweet home men ate the fresh corn that came from the stalks broken by Seth and Hal. 
Chapter 3 Denver turns to the outdoors for comfort and contemplation. Since childhood, she has sought privacy in what she calls her emerald closet, a bower formed by a ring of boxwood bushes that smells of cologne. She once built there. One time, as she was returning from the bower, through the window, Denver saw Seth kneeling in prayer in Baby Sugg's room. A ghostly white dress knelt beside Seth with its arm around her waist. Denver interpreted the vision as a sign that the baby ghost had plans. Paul D, she thinks resentfully, has now interrupted those plans. When Denver had asked her mother what she was praying about, Seth told her she was thinking about time, memory and the past. In Seth's philosophy, nothing ever dies. This means the past events continue to occur, not only in one's rememory, but also somehow in the real world. Seth believes it is possible to bump into past events and places again, and her main priority is shielding Denver from these tangible, painful collisions with the past. Seth ran away from the sweet home when she was pregnant with Denver. Seth's feet had become raw lumps of flesh by the time she collapsed in the woods, where she was found by a white girl, Amy Denver. Amy explained that she had just completed a childhood of indentured servitude and was heading to Boston to get some carmine velvet. Carmine, Amy explained, is what people who buy velvet in Boston call dread. When Amy asked Seth her name, Seth told her a false name, Lou. If Seth were caught, she could be sent back to sweet home. Amy led Seth to an abandoned lean-to and massaged her tortured feet back to life. Seth later gave birth to her baby with Amy's help, naming the child after the compassionate girl. Because the story is about her birth, Denver loves to hear it being told. After the episode in which Denver believed she saw the baby ghost kneeling next to her praying mother, Seth told Denver about school teacher, who was Mrs. Garner's brother-in-law. After Mr. Garner died, school teacher came with his two nephews to run the farm. School teacher used to record his observations of the slaves in a notebook. He prodded them with strange questions, and Seth believes that the questions broke Sikso's spirit permanently. As Paul D repairs the furniture he damaged during his confrontation with the ghost, he sings songs he learned while in a chain gang in Alfred, Georgia. After his traumatizing prison experience, he shut down a large part of his heart and head, operating only what helped him walk, eat, sleep, sing. The experience of seeing Seth again reopens the locked part of his mind, and he decides to stay at 124. Seth tells Paul D that after her escape, school teacher came to Cincinnati to take her and her children back to Sweet Home. Seth went to jail instead and took Denver with her. Paul D does not ask her for details because the mention of jail reminds him of his experiences in Alfred. Paul D's decision to stay gives Seth hopes for her future. Chapter 4 Denver hurts Paul D by asking him how long he plans to hang around. Seth is mortified by Denver's behaviour but refuses to allow Paul D to criticise her daughter. Paul D interprets this as a sign of intense motherly love and thinks it is dangerous for an ex-slave to love anything too much. Paul D has learned to love the individuals in his life only partially so that he has enough love left over for the next person when the first is taken away. Paul D promises Seth that she can safely re-enter her past because he will be there to catch her if she falls. He invites Denver and Seth to a carnival in town that is having a special day for blacks. At the carnival, Denver surprises herself by having a good time. The people they see there greet her casually, rather than showing her contempt that she expects. Because he is such an extrovert and so shamelessly thrilled by the carnival, Paul D is a hit with the other carnival goers. He thus helps reintegrate Seth and Denver into the community and makes a few acquaintances. He also inquired about getting a job. Paul D is amused by the spectacle of the supposed wild African savage because he says he knew the man back in Roanoke. On the way to and from the carnival, the smell of rotting roses is overpowering. Also, both on the way and there and on the way back, Seth notices that the three shadows of Paul D, Denver and herself overlap so as to be appear to holding hands. She interprets this as a promising sign that signals future happiness. Chapter 5 a fully dressed woman walks out of a stream and falls asleep beneath a mulberry tree. The woman moves to a tree stump near the steps of 124, where Paul D, Seth and Denver 
find her as they return from the carnival. Seth suddenly feels a strange, irrepressible need to urinate and is reminded of a water breaking before Denver's death. Denver and Paul Day take the woman inside where she drinks cup after cup of water. Her name, it turns out, is Beloved. Her skin is as smooth as a baby's and she has no recollection of the past. Denver notes that here, Boy, the dog that was disfigured during one of the baby ghost's rage, has disappeared. Beloved sleeps for four days, waking only to ask for water. While Beloved sleeps, Denver cares for her with a possessive devotion. Beloved's presence makes Paul D. uneasy. He remarks that although she acts and sounds sick, she does not show visible signs of ill health. The other day, he tells Seth he saw her pick a rocking chair with one hand. He claims that Denver was also watching, but when he asks Denver for confirmation, she denies having seen any such thing. Chapter 6 Beloved develops a strange attachment to Seth. Although she usually hates discussing the past, Seth enjoys pouring stories into Beloved's eager years. Beloved asks what has happened to what she calls Seth's diamonds. Seth replies that she once owned some crystal earrings given to her by Mrs. Garner for her wedding. She then recounts the story of a haphazard patchwork wedding dress. As she watches Seth arrange Denver's hair, Beloved asks about Seth's mother. Seth explains that she rarely saw her. Seth remembers that her mother once took her aside and showed her a circle and a cross that had been burned into her skin. She said that Seth could use these marks to identify her body if she died. When Seth asked to be marked too, her mother slapped her. Seth tells the girls that she did not understand why her mother had done this until she had a mark of her own. Seth mentions that her mother was hanged and she is suddenly stunned by the recollection of a disturbing memory that she had forgotten. Seth ran to her dead mother, but Nan, another slave woman, pulled Seth away from her mother's body when Seth tried to search for the mark. Speaking in her mother's long-forgotten language, Nan told Seth that the two women had come across the sea in the same ship. The white crew members had raped them repeatedly, but Seth's mother threw away the children she had by the white men. Seth was kept because she had a black father for whom she was named. Chapter 7 Beloved's presence, especially what is described as a shining sexuality, disturbs Baldy. He anxiously interrogates her about her past until Seth, sensing Beloved's agitation, interrupts him. Afterward, Seth chastises Paul D for pressing Beloved so cruelly, and during their argument, Hal's name comes up. Paul D then tells Seth the reason Hal didn't meet her during the escape as planned. Hal was in the loft of the barn when Seth was violated by school teacher's nephews. Afterward, he found himself unable to leave. When Seth realizes that Hal saw everything that the school teacher and his nephews did to her, she is initially furious that he did not even intervene. But Paul D explains that Hal was shattered by the experience. Afterward, Paul D saw him sitting blankly by a butter churn. He had smeared butter all over his face. At the time, Paul D was ignorant of the events in the barn and thus wondered what had caused this breakdown in Hal. However, Paul D could not physically form the words to ask him because he had an iron bit in his mouth. Outside, Seth and Paul D discussed the shame of wearing the bit. Paul D says that the worst part of the punishment was seeing the farm's rooster, named Mr. watch him and walk around more freely than himself. It is thoughts like these that Paul D keeps locked within the rusted tobacco tin of his heart. Chapter 8 While Seth and Paul D sit on the porch, Beloved and Denver dance together inside the house. Denver asks Beloved how she got her name and Beloved replies that it is her name in the dark. Denver asks what it is like in the dark place from which Beloved came. Beloved says that when she was there, she was small and curled up. It was hot and crowded with lots of other people, and some of them were dead. She describes a bridge and water. When Denver asks her why she came back, Beloved mentions Seth, saying she wanted to see her face. Denver feels slighted that she was not the main reason for Beloved's return. Denver asks Beloved not to tell Seth who she really is. Beloved becomes angry and tells Denver never to tell her what to do. She reminds Denver that she doesn't need her. Seth is the only one she needs. The two girls sit in uncomfortable silence until Beloved asks Denver to narrate the story of Denver's birth. 
as Daniel watches the way Beloved eagerly drinks in every detail, she is able to envision the story she narrates. Denver tells Beloved about how Amy Denver found Seth and discerned the image of a choke cherry tree in Seth's bleeding scars. After Amy cleaned the wounds, the two women spent the night in a lean-to shelter. The next morning, Amy helped Seth limp down to the river where they found a leaky boat with one oar. It was upon stepping into the boat that Seth's water broke. It seemed as though the newborn Denver might die, but Amy finally coaxed a whimper out of her. Later that evening, Amy left Seth waiting by the river bank for a chance to cross the river to Ohio. Chapter 9 Disturbed by Paul D's information about Hal and missing the soothing presence that baby Suggs once provided, Seth seeks comfort in a place called the Clearing. She takes Denver and Beloved with her. Before baby Suggs fell into a depression for which Seth blames herself, the older woman used to preach to the black community of Cincinnati in the Clearing. She would begin by having the people participate in a cathartic mixture of crying, laughter and dance, and she would then preach self-love. She would instruct them to love their hands that had been bound, their mouths that had been silenced, and most of all, their hearts. Seth recalls the day she arrived at 124 and met Baby Sucks for the first time. After Denver's birth and Amy Denver's departure, she came across a black man fishing with two boys. The man, Stamp Bade, grabbed Denver in a jacket and pulled Seth across the Ohio. On shore, he left a signal for Ella, another organiser of the Underground Railroad, which alerted her to the presence of a passenger who needed help. When Ella arrived, Seth explained that she was heading to Baby Sugg's house on Bluestone Road. Ella, noting Seth's attachment to Denver, voiced her opinion that one shouldn't love anything too much. When Seth got to 124, Baby Suggs welcomed and bathed her before allowing her to see her two boys and her crawling already girl. To amuse her daughter, Seth jingled the earrings that Miss Garner had given her. During the 28 days she spent in Cincinnati before her daughter's death, Seth enjoyed being a part of the community. In the clearing, she had felt for the first time as though she owned herself. As she sits on Baby Sugg's old rock in the clearing, Seth calls silently for the calming fingers of a deceased mother-in-law. She begins to feel Baby Sugg's massaging her neck, but the touch turns suddenly violent and Seth realises she is being strangled. Denver reacts with alarm and Beloved caresses and kisses the bruises on Seth's neck. Beloved's breath smells like milk to Seth and a touch feels like that of the baby's ghost. Alarmed, Seth pushes Beloved away, saying, You're too old for that. Later, Denver accuses Beloved of strangling Seth. Beloved runs away in anger, insisting that Seth was being choked by the circle of iron, not by her. We learn that as a seven-year-old, Denver attended school lessons with the other black children at the home of a woman they called Lady Jones. Denver had been studying there for a year when her classmate Nelson Lord upset her by asking, didn't your mother get locked away for murder? Denver repeated the question to her mother, but she went deaf before she could hear an answer. This deafness was cured by the sound of the baby ghost climbing the stairs. It was the first time the ghost had appeared, but after this first innocuous manifestation, the ghost proceeded to become spiteful, angry and deliberately abusive. Thinking back to these acts of rage, Denver wonders what havoc Beloved might now wreck on Seth. Yet she believes that she has no power to stop her, especially since she so often feels captivated by the girl. When she goes to Beloved to seek forgiveness for fighting with her, she sees Beloved watching two turtles mate. Chapter 10 Paul D. was sent to prison in Alfred, Georgia because he tried to kill Brandywine, the man to whom school teacher sold him. The prison had 46 inmates, all of them black. They were locked in small boxes in the ground at night and were subject to sexual abuse and chain gang work during the day. During this time, Paul D. began to tremble chronically and his trembling only subsided when he was actively working and singing in the chain gang. Once, during a long rainstorm, the ground turned to mud which allowed the prisoners to work together and escape. Linked together with one chain, they walked to a camp of ailing Cherokees, who broke their chain. 
They directed Baldy northward by telling him that he should follow the blooms of the flowers as the warm spring temperatures spread from south to north. In Delaware, he met a weaver woman with whom he proceeded to live for 18 months. As time went on, he logged all his painful memories of the prison and sweet home into his tobacco tin lodged in his chest. Chapter 11 At 124 Bluestone Road, Paul D. feels inexplicably restless and uncomfortable in every room. Eventually, he is only able to sleep outside the house. He realizes that Beloved is moving him around the house like a rag doll. One night, Beloved comes to Paul D. in the cold house where he now sleeps and says, I want you to touch me on the inside part, and you have to call me my name. Paul D. tries to resist her strange power, but he has sex with her, and the tin tobacco box breaks open. He repeats the phrase, Red Heart, over and over. Chapter 12 Denver's attachment to Beloved intensifies. Beloved's gaze sustains and completes Denver, and Denver fears that she has no self apart from Beloved. Meanwhile, Seth, ignoring her earlier sense that Beloved is her daughter's reincarnation, decides that Beloved must have recently escaped from years of captivity. She knows Ella to have endured such an experience. A white man and his son locked her up and raped her repeatedly. Denver often feels lonely and rejected by Beloved. When she isn't directly stimulated, Beloved lapses into a dreamy silence and she never interacts as much with Denver as she does with Seth. Denver, interested only in the present, does not care for the stories about the past that Seth narrates in response to Beloved's questions. Denver also knows about Beloved's attentions to Paul D because she noted her nighttime trips to the cold house where he sleeps. One day, Denver and Beloved go into the cold house to get cider. Suddenly, Beloved disappears into the darkness. Denver is certain that Beloved has gone forever and begins to cry, only to find Beloved in front of her, smiling. Beloved reassures Denver by telling her, This is the place I am. Beloved then drops to the ground where she curls up and moans softly. Her eyes focus on a spot in the darkness where she claims to see her face. When Denver asks her to clarify, she says mysteriously, It's me. Chapter 13 Thinking about school teacher's arrival at Sweet Home makes Paul D. again question the legitimacy of his manhood in the way that school teacher used to force him to do. He likens Beloved's current manipulation of him to school teacher's abuse and decides that the only way he can hope to stop Beloved is to tell Seth what's been happening. He meets her outside the restaurant where she works, but he cannot muster up enough courage to confess that he is not a man. He surprises himself and Seth, who thinks he is about to tell her he is leaving, by asking her to have a baby with him. It begins to snow and they laugh and flirt on the walk home. Beloved, who has been waiting for Seth, meets him outside and absorbs Seth's attention, leaving Paul D feeling cold and resentful. Seth, however, breaks Beloved's spell by insisting that Paul D. resume sleeping with her at night. Seth decides she cannot have a baby with Paul D. because unless carefree, mother love was a killer. She begins to question Paul D.'s intentions. Perhaps she thinks he is jealous of Denver and Beloved and wants his own family. Ultimately, Seth recognizes that she is just trying to justify her decision to not have any more children. Chapter 14 after Seth takes Paul D upstairs, Beloved begs Denver to drive Paul D away, but Denver replies that Seth will be angry at Beloved if Paul D leaves. One of Beloved's teeth falls out and she wonders fearfully if her entire body will begin to fall apart. She finds it difficult to feel complete and unified when Seth is away. Beloved begins to cry and Denver takes her in her arms, while the snow gathered outside 124 miles higher and higher. Chapter 15 after Seth first arrived at 124, Stampade brought over two pails of rare, deliciously sweet blackberries. Baby Suggs decided to bake some pies and before long the celebration had transformed into a feast for 90 people. The community celebrated long into the night but grew jealous and angry as the feast wore on. To them, the excess of the feast was a measure of Baby Suggs' unwarranted pride. Baby Suggs sensed 
a dark and coming thing in the distance, but the atmosphere of jealousy created by the townspeople clouded her perception. From Seth's arrival at 124, the narration goes even further back in time to Sweet Home. Although it meant leaving behind the only child she had been able to see grow into adulthood, baby Suggs allowed Hal to buy her freedom because it mattered so much to him. Once she left Sweet Home, baby Suggs realized how sweet freedom could be. While Mr. Garner drove her to Cincinnati, she asked him why he and Mrs. Garner called her Jenny. He told her that Jenny Whitlow was the name on her bill of sale. She explains the origin of her real name. Suggs was her husband's name and he called her Baby. Mr. Garner tells her that Baby Suggs is no name for a freed Negro. He takes Baby Suggs to Ohio to meet the Baldwins, two white abolitionist siblings who allow Baby Suggs to live at 124 Bluestone Road in exchange for domestic work. Baby Suggs is unable to learn anything about the whereabouts of her lost children. Chapter 16 One day about a month after Seth arrived at 124, school teacher showed up at the house with one of his nephews, the sheriff and a slave catcher. In the woodshed, they found Seth's sons, Howard and Bugler, lying in the sawdust, bleeding. Seth was holding her bleeding, crawling already daughter, whose throat she had cut with a saw. Stampede rushed in and grabbed Denver before Seth could dash her brains out against the wall. Because none of the children could ever be of any use as a slave, school teacher concluded that there was nothing worth claiming at 124 and left in disgust. Seth's older daughter was dead, but baby Suggs bound the boy's wounds and struggled with Seth over Denver. Denver nursed at Seth's breast, ingesting her dead sister's blood along with her mother's milk. The sheriff took Seth, with Denver in her arms, to jail. Chapter 17 Stampage shows Paul D a newspaper clipping with the drawing of Seth, but Paul D refusing to believe that the woman depicted is Seth insists that ain't her mouth. Paul D can't read, so Stampage tells him the story of Seth's tragedy. Stampage leaves some parts of the story out though. He doesn't tell how Seth grabbed her children and flew with them to the woodshed, like a hawk on the wing, nor does he mention that out of jealous spite the community neglected to warn Seth about school teacher's approach. Chapter 18. When Paul D. confronts Seth with the newspaper clipping, she begins to circle frantically around the room in a manner that parallels the circular manner in which she unravels her story for him. She tells Paul D. how at 124 she began to love her children with renewed force because she knew finally that they were fully hers to love. When she recognized school teacher's hat outside the house one day, she felt hummingbird wings beating around her head and could think only. No, 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 no. Killing her children was a way of protecting them from the horrors of slavery she herself had endured, a way to secure their safety. Paul D tells her that her love is too thick. He feels distant from Seth and condemns her act, saying, You got two feet, Seth, not four, by which he suggests that she acted like a beast in attempting to murder, murder her own children. His anxiety increases when he sees Beloved standing on the staircase. He leaves 124 and Seth simply says, so long. Although he does not say so, Seth knows that Paul D isn't coming back. Moving on to part two. Chapter 19. When Stamp paid, hears that Paul D has left 124, he feels guilty for having told Paul D about Seth's crime without considering her family's welfare. Stamp paid reminds himself that he has a duty to Seth and Denver by virtue of their connection to baby Suggs, of whom he was very fond. He thinks about her late life depression, which deeply saddened him. He tried to convince her to continue preaching God's word, but she claimed that she had lost all motivation after the white man's intrusion into her household. For the first time since baby Suggs' death, Stamp returns to 124. When he approaches the house, he hears a clamor of disturbing, disembodied conversation. He can discern only the word mine. Although he has a habit of walking into houses without knocking, it is the one privilege he claims in exchange for the good he does for the Cincinnati community. Stampade feels uncomfortable entering 124 unannounced. He stands awkwardly at the door and thinks about what he ought to do. Seth takes beloved in Denver ice skating, partly to show that she has not been devastated by Paul D's departure. 
Later, Seth hears Beloved humming a song Seth made up to sing to her children. Faced with such evidence, Seth finally recognizes Beloved as her resurrected daughter. Now that her dead child has rejoined her, she decides to discard the past and the future for the timeless present of 124. After returning to 124 several more times and finding himself unable to knock on each occasion, Stamp Bade finally works up the courage to knock on Seth's door. No one answers. When he peeks in the window, he sees Denver sleeping in front of the fire, but he does not recognize Beloved and her presence disturbs him. When he asks around about the stranger in Seth's home, his friend Ella tells him that Paul D is sleeping at the church. Stamp chastises Ella for not offering Paul a place to stay, and he is angered by the community's general neglect of Paul D and of the women. Stamp wonders whether perhaps he has made a mistake in staying away from 124 for so long whether he might not owe something to baby Sugg's kin. Earlier in his life, he decided that he no longer owed anyone anything. While a slave, Stamp was forced to give his wife to his master's son to sleep with, and he concluded that his wife was a gift so terrible that it freed him forever after all of obligation. For this reason, he changed his name from Joshua to Stamp Pate. Seth cooks all morning at a restaurant and then takes her lunch home. Occasionally, she steals food and supplies because she is too proud to endure the local grocer's racism. She feels ashamed of her petty thievery and remembers an occasion when Sikso stole a small pig from Sweet Home. When school teacher confronted him, Sikso cleverly talked his way out of blame by insisting that he was actually improving school teacher's property by feeding himself that he, so that he could better work the land. School teacher whipped him to teach him that definitions belonged to the definers not to the defined. Seth's memory of Sikso launches a series of other memories about Sweet Home and slavery. One is so painful that Seth has told it to no one but Beloved. School teacher treated the slaves like farm stock, measuring their body parts and studying them by, like biological specimens. Once, Seth overheard him saying, overheard him giving a lesson to his nephews about her in which he instructed them to categorize each of her characteristics as either human or animal. School teacher again manifested his cruelty when after baby Suck's departure, he stopped Hal from doing any more work outside Sweet Home, thus depriving him of the chance to pay for the rest of his family's release from slavery. This incident sparked the family to plot a secret escape, but their plan met with a tragic conclusion. Hal went insane, Paul A was hanged, Sikso was burned and Paul D ended up with a bit in his mouth. Seth recalls one night when she and Hal discussed the days of Mr. Garner's rule of sweet home, the days before school teacher and his sadistic nephews arrived. Hal had surprised Seth by saying that he saw no real difference between Garner's kind of slavery and school teachers. When Stamp runs away from 124 without knocking, he believes that the undecipherable voices he hears from the porch of the house belong to the black and angry dead. The chapter ends with Stamp's thoughts about how slavery dehumanizes everyone involved, including the whites. By defining the blacks as jungle-like, the whites plant resentment among the blacks that bourgeois into a real jungle anger. The whites in turn become so frightened of their own creation that they too begin to behave brutally like animals. The jungle, Stamp thinks, touches everyone, but it is normally hidden. Only from time to time does it manifest itself in rumblings, such as the ones he hears from 124. Chapter 20 With Chapter 20, a series of stream of consciousness monologues begins. Seth speaks in this chapter, followed by Denver in Chapter 21 and Beloved in Chapter 22. Chapter 23 comprises a chorus of three voices. In Chapter 20, Seth begins, Beloved, she my daughter, she mine. Seth wants to explain everything to Beloved so that her daughter will understand why her own mother killed her. Seth cannot understand why, despite all the clues, she initially failed to recognize that Beloved was her daughter incarnate. She decides Paul D must have distracted her. Throughout the chapter, Seth wonders the power of a mother's love. She remembers that her own mother was hanged, but she does not know the circumstances that prompted the lynching. Perhaps her mother attempted to run away, but without Seth. Seth wants to believe her mother would never have abandoned her, 
but she was as devoted a mother as Seth herself. After killing Beloved, Seth wanted to lie down in the grave with her dead daughter, yet she knew she couldn't give up. She had to keep going for the sake of her three living children. Chapter 21 Denver's voice emerges in this chapter which begins, Beloved is my sister. Denver knows that she has swallowed her sister's blood along with her mother's milk. She confesses that she has loved Seth out of fear and that Howard and Bugler ran away because they, like Denver, feared that whatever it was that motivated Seth to kill her children might resurface one day. Denver believes that Beloved returned to help her wait for her father to come home. Denver is also convinced that she must protect Beloved from Seth. She remembers everything Baby Socks told her about Hal, which was that she, he was an angel who loved things too much. The power of his love used to scare Baby Socks because she knew that the large size of his heart made it an easy target. Denver's youth has been comprised of a fear of her mother and her hope for her father's arrival. Chapter 22 Beloved's fragmented and complex monologue constitutes the third of the first-person stream of consciousness monologues. She begins, I am beloved and she is mine. Her patchy memories are of a time when she crouched among dead bodies. She speaks of thirst and hunger, of death and sickness, and of men without skin. She says all the people are trying to leave their bodies behind. Beloved then focuses on a woman whose face she wants because it is hers. The rest of the monologue consists of Beloved's description of her attempt to join with the woman. She wishes she could bite the iron circle from around the woman's neck and mentions the woman's sharp earrings and round basket several times. At the end of the chapter, Beloved is in the water and neither she nor the woman has an iron circle around her neck any longer. She is swallowed by the woman and suddenly she is the woman. She sees herself swim and, and says, I am alone. She then describes emerging from the water and needing to find a place to be. When she opens her eyes, she sees the face she lost. She says that Seth's is the face that left her. Beloved ends her monologue by saying, Now we can join a hot thing. Chapter 23 Beloved's words give way to a passage of poetic prose in which the three women's voices come together and mingle, although not in a typical dialogic style. Beloved says that she and Seth lost and found one another. She tells Seth that she came back from the other side for her and that she remembers her and that she's scared the men without skin will come back. Seth assures her that they will not. Denver warns Beloved not to love Seth too much. Beloved says she already loves Seth too much and Denver promises to protect her. Beloved begs Seth never to leave her again and Seth complies. Beloved laments that Seth left and hurt her. Chapter 24 Paul D, who has been sleeping in the basement of the local church, is filled with despair. He reflects on his past and notes that his two half-brothers, Paul A and Paul F, are the only family he has ever known. He does not remember his mother and never saw his father. Throughout his life, whenever he met large black families living together, he loved to hear them describe to him how they were related. Paul D's thoughts turned to Mr. Garner, who always said that he treated his slaves as real men. In his mind, Paul D has contrasted school teachers' emasculating and dehumanizing treatment of him and his fellow slaves with the more humane treatment of Mr. Garner. Now Paul D begins to follow Hal in questioning whether there was any difference in the slaves' conditions under the two men. Paul D partially blames his despair on his previous belief that he could build a life with Seth. He believes that he set his goals too high and has consequently suffered a great fall. Yet he locates the beginning of his downfall far in the past, in the tragic outcome of the slave's escape plan. Hal and Paul A. failed to appear at the appointed meeting time and in their places stood school teacher, his nephews and other white men, waiting for Paul D. and Sikso. Sikso's lover, the 30-mile woman, had escaped and after he was captured, Sikso behaved so frantically that school teacher became convinced he would never again be a suitable slave. While school teacher tried to burn him alive, Sikso only laughed, the first time Paul D ever heard him do so. He shouted, 7-0, over and over, referring to the baby the 30-mile woman escaped with inside her. School teacher and the other men dragged Paul D back home where he encountered Seth. Despite the recent disaster, she, tell she still intended to run. 
that was the last time the two saw each other, and Paul D. concludes that Seth's rape and the theft of her milk must have taken place directly afterward. It was in the aftermath of the failed escape that Paul D. first learned the price he fetched, $900. The knowledge forever affected his understanding of himself. He wonders what Paul F.'s price was and what Seth's would be. He questions whether his life since his aborted escape has been worth it, whether he should have thrown himself into the fire with Sikso. Chapter 25 Stamp paid visits Paul D. in the church and finds that Paul D. has been drinking his troubles away. A white man stops by to ask if the men know Judy of Plank Road. Though Stamp knows her, he feigns ignorance. The white man reprimands Paul D. for drinking on church grounds and then rides away. Stamp paid tells Paul D. that during the year that his young master slept with Vashti, Stamp's wife, Stamp paid did not touch her. When Vashti came to him, one night to tell him that she had returned for good, he felt the terrible urge to break her neck. Instead, he changed his name. The conversation turns to 124 and Stamp Paid tells Paul D that he was present when Seth tried to kill her children. He defends Seth's actions, saying she only wanted to out-hurt the, hunt, the hurter. Paul D replies that Seth scares him, but that beloved scares him more. Stamp Paid asks if Paul D left 124 because of beloved, but Paul D does not answer. Moving on to part 3. Chapter 26. Like a parasite, Beloved begins to drain Seth's life force. Seth arrives at work late every morning until she loses her job. The food in the house begins to run low and Seth sacrifices a portion for Beloved, who grows fat while Seth wastes away. Beloved wears Seth's clothing and copies her mannerisms until Denver has trouble telling them apart. Their roles merge and invert as Seth comes to act like a child while Beloved looms over her like a mother. When Seth tries to assert herself, Beloved reacts violently and breaks things, and the two fight constantly. Seth points out how much she has suffered for her children, but Beloved accuses her of leaving her behind. Denver begins to fear that Beloved will kill her mother. Denver decides to leave 124 to find help. Before she can do so, she needs and gets some encouragement from the spirit of baby Suggs, because Denver hasn't left the house by herself in 12 years and fears the outside world. Not knowing where else to turn, Denver goes to the house of a former teacher, Lady Jones. Although part of the black community, Lady Jones has yellow hair and grey eyes. Ironically, Lady Jones was chosen to attend a school in Pennsylvania for coloured girls because of her light skin. Afterward, she devoted herself to teaching those who were not picked to attend school. Because she loathes her yellow hair, she married the darkest man she could find. She is convinced that everyone, including her own children, despise her and her hair. Omitting mention of Beloved, Denver explains that her mother is sick and asks Lady Joan if there is any work she can do in exchange for food. Lady Jones knows of no work, but she tells everyone at church about Seth's troubles. Denver begins finding plates and baskets of food on the tree stump in front of 124. Many include a slip of paper with the donator's name. And as Denver ventures out to return the containers to their owners, she becomes acquainted with the community. Lady Jones also offers her weekly reading lessons. As the trouble at 124 continues, Denver visits the Podwins for help. Their black maid, Janie, answers the door and recognizes Denver as a relative of Baby Suggs. Denver tells her about Beloved and Janie circulates the story around town. Denver secures a job with the Bodwins, but as she leaves their house, she is disturbed by the sight of a figurine on display. The statue is a slave who holds coins in its mouth. At its base is a tag that reads, At your service. Ella hears Denver's story. Although she sees Beloved's tormenting presence as a fair punishment for Seth's act of infanticide, she does not believe that the punishment is right, because she believes that past sins should stay in the past. She empathises with Seth because she also once refused to care for her child. The child was born of abuse after Ella had been locked up for a year and repeatedly raped by her father and son. Ella decides to rally a group of roughly 30 black women to exercise Beloved from 124. They march to Seth's house where Denver is waiting for Mr. Bodwin to pick her up for work. When Seth and Beloved hear the women begin to sing, 
They go outside to the porch. The woman sees Seth, small and shrunken, standing next to a beautiful, naked, pregnant woman. Seth spots Mr. Podman coming up the road and mistakes him for school teacher. She, rus- she rushes from the porch, waving an ice pick, leaving Beloved alone. Beloved watches as Denver also leaves her side to chase after Seth. All the women rush to prevent Seth from killing Mr. Podman. At the beginning of the next chapter, we will learn what happened next through the narration of Stampede. Apparently, Ella punched Seth before she could attack Mr. Podman. And women held her down. Then, after subduing Seth, the women looked up to find that Beloved has disappeared. Chapter 27 Stampede tells Paul D. about recent events at 124. The old man says he no longer hears the voices around the house that he used to, and that Beloved disappeared in the chaos that followed Seth's attempts to attack Mr. Boardman. A small boy said he saw a naked woman running through the woods with fish for hair, but no one has seen her since. Baldy asks Stenberg if she believes Beloved was really her baby sister who had come back from the other side. Denver replies that she believes Beloved to have been her sister, but at times she thinks Beloved was more. Denver continues to work for Miss Potwin, who is giving her informal academic training in the hopes of sending Denver to Oberlin College. Denver wants Paul D. to speak kindly to Seth, who has not yet recovered entirely. Paul D. walks to 124 and thinks about the series of escapes he has undertaken in his life. He ran from Sweet Home, he ran from Alfred Georgia, and during the war, he worked for both sides and ran from both. After the war, he thought he was free to walk the roads, but he saw dead blacks strewn everywhere, including women and children. He still had to keep running. Paul D. wonders why he ran from Seth. When Paul D. reaches 124, he senses that Beloved has left forever. He finds Seth lying in Baby Sugg's bed with vacant eyes. He fears that like Baby Sugg's before her, Seth wants simply to lie down and wait for death. He tells her that he wants to help Denver take care of her. She replies miserably that her best thing has left her again, and Paul D. wonders at the range of emotions that Seth inspires in him. Sixo once told him that his 30-mile woman inspired his love because she gathered up the jumbled pieces of him and gave them back to him in order. Paul thinks that Seth does the same for him. She helps him to stop being ashamed of his past, and he notes that when he is with her, the memories of being collared and muzzled like a beast no longer have the power to steal his manhood from him. He tells her that they have more of yesterday than they need, and they need more tomorrow to make the yesterday bearable. Taking her hand, he tells Seth that she shouldn't consider Beloved's departure to be the departure of a best thing. Seth, and not her children, is her own best thing. Chapter 28 As though Beloved were a bad dream, everyone tries to forget her. The community sees her as a representative of an implacable loneliness that cannot be soothed or robbed away. Never satisfied, it roams and devours. Seth, Denver and Paul D. take longer to forget Beloved than the townspeople do. Nevertheless, after a while they realize they cannot remember or repeat a single thing she said. In fact, they cannot say with certainty that she was ever really there. Moving on to character analysis. Seth, an iron-willed, iron-eyed woman, Seth is haunted not only by the ghost of her dead daughter, but also by the memories of her life as a slave. While she has been scared by the physical brutality of school teachers' nephews, she seems even more deeply disturbed by her discovery that most white people view her as nothing more than an animal. She asserts her humanity through her determination to reach freedom and to give her children a free life. Her escape from Sweet Home demonstrates the force of her will to overcome impossible circumstances and foreshadows the desperate measures that she'll take to keep her children from becoming slaves. Much of Seth's internal struggle also derives from her ambiguous relationship with her mother. Because of the long hours her mother worked, Seth barely knew her. However, through Nan, she knows that she was the product of a loving union. Of all her mother's children, Seth was the only one given a name and allowed to live. The comfort she may derive from this knowledge is tempered, though, by the suspicion that her mother was trying to run away when she was caught and hanged. If her mother was indeed trying to escape, she was abandoning Seth in the process. This abandonment was twofold. 
because a mother not only left Seth without her only living relative, but she also forced Seth to face the horrors of slavery on her own. Her mother's abandonment affected Seth deeply and helps explain the choices she herself makes as a mother. Notice Seth's resolve not to do the same thing to her children. She refuses to leave them without a mother when they've gone ahead to Ohio, and she risks her own life to reach them. When faced with the reality that her children may be sent back into slavery, Seth chooses to free them through death rather than allow them to encounter even a portion of her past experiences. In Seth's mind, killing her children to save them from slavery is the ultimate expression of a mother's love. Beloved. Beloved's elusive, complex identity is central to our understanding of the novel. She may, as Seth originally believes, be an ordinary woman who is locked up by a white man and never let out of doors. Her limited linguistic ability, neediness, baby soft skin and emotional instability could all be explained by a lifetime spent in captivity. But these traits could also support the theory that is held by most of the characters in the novel, as well as most readers. Beloved is the embodiment spirit of Seth's dead daughter. Beloved is the age the baby would have been had it lived and she bears the name printed on the baby's tombstone. She first appears to Seth soaking wet, as though newly born, and Seth has a sensation of her water breaking when she sees her. Additionally, Beloved knows about a pair of earrings Seth possessed long ago. She hums a song Seth made up for her children. She has a long scar under her chin, where her death wound would have been dealt, and her breath smells like milk. Because Seth's mother came from Africa, the experience that Beloved remembers is also Seth's mother's experience. In a sense, Beloved is not only Seth's daughter, but her mother as well. Because Beloved is supernatural and represents the spirit of multiple people, Morrison doesn't develop her character as an individual. Beloved acts as a force rather than as a person, compelling Seth, Denver and Paul D to behave in certain ways. Beloved defines herself through Seth's experiences and actions, and in the beginning she acts as a somewhat positive force, helping Seth face the past by repeatedly asking her to tell the stories about her life. In the end, however, Beloved's need becomes overwhelming and her attachment to Seth becomes destructive. Notice that Morrison dictates the book to 60 million and more, an estimated number of people who died in slavery. Beloved represents Seth's unnamed child, but also the unnamed masses that died and were forgotten. With this book, Morrison states that they are Beloved as well. Although Beloved vanishes at the end of the book, she is never really gone. Her dress and her story, forgotten by the town but preserved by the novel, remain. Beloved represents a destructive and painful past, but she also signals the possibility of a brighter future. She gives the people of 124 and eventually the entire community a chance to engage with the memories they've suppressed. Through confrontation, the community can reclaim and learn from its forgotten and ignored memories. Denver Seth's daughter Denver is the most dynamic character in the novel. She is shy, intelligent, introspective, sensitive and inclined to spend hours alone in an emerald closet, a sylvan space formed by boxwood bushes. Her mother considers Denver a charmed child who has miraculously survived and throughout the book Denver is in close contact with the supernatural. Despite Denver's abilities to cope, she has been stunted emotionally by years of relative isolation. Though 18 years old, she acts much younger, maintaining an intense fear of the world outside 124 and a perilously fragile sense of self. Indeed, her self-conception remains so tentative that she feels slighted by the idea of a world that does not include her, even the world of slavery at Sweet Home. Denver defines her identity in relation to Seth. She also defines herself in relation to her sister, first in the form of the baby ghost, then in the form of Beloved. When she feels that she is being excluded from her family's attentions, for example, when a mother devotes her energies to Paul D, Denver feels threatened and angry. Correspondingly, she treats Paul D coldly much of the time. In the face of Beloved's escalating malevolence and her mother's submissiveness, Denver is forced to step outside the world of 124. Filled with a sense of duty, purpose and courage, she enlists the help of the community and cares for her increasingly self-involved mother and sister. She enters a series of lessons with Miss Baldwin and considers attending Oberlin College someday. Her last conversation with Paul D underscores her newfound maturity. 
She presents herself with more civility and sincerity than in the past and asserts that she has her own opinions now. Baby Suggs acts as a mother figure and stabilizing force for Seth and Denver. A self-proclaimed preacher, Baby Suggs draws upon the beauty of nature to make the community of ex-slaves recognize the beauty in themselves. She provides a nurturing and healing presence for those scarred by slavery, including Seth. When the black community betrays her and doesn't warn her or Seth about the school teacher's approach, Baby Suggs loses her faith in people. She withdraws from the community into an internal world of colors and introspection. Her withdrawal allows Seth to withdraw as well, leading to a long estrangement with the townspeople. Baby Suggs' influence is vital enough, however, that her presence is felt after her death, not in a haunting way like beloved spirit, but in a strengthening way in which her words and attitudes linger in the minds of those who loved her. Her presence helps comfort Seth even years after she dies, and it encourages Denver to leave the house and seek help. Paul D. A kind and meditative man, Paul D.'s memories rival Seth's in their shocking nature. However, whereas Seth's past continues to dominate her, Paul D. has begun to move beyond his past and to envision a future of hope. His entrance into Seth's life represents the potential for a happier future for her and Denver. Because he came from her past and shares some of the experiences that haunt her, Seth can open herself up to Paul D. and find some relief in sharing the burden of her memories. Seth is drawn to the promise of happiness that she finds with Paul D, but Beloved's arrival stops her movement toward what he represents. Intelligent and perceptive, Paul D recognizes the danger in Beloved's presence but is unable to do anything about it. All he can do is challenge Seth's vision of herself and her children. In the end, after Beloved leaves, we sense that Paul D will provide a healing force for Seth, again offering her the possibility of a brighter future and helping her learn to love herself. Moving on to theme analysis. Slavery. Beloved explores the physical, emotional and spiritual devastation wrought by slavery, a devastation that continues to haunt those characters who are former slaves, even in freedom. The most dangerous of slavery's effects is its negative impact on the former slave's sense of self, and the novel contains multiple examples of self-alienation. Paul D, for instance, is so alienated from himself that at one point, he cannot tell whether the screaming he hears is his own or someone else's. Slaves were told they were subhuman and were traded as commodities, whose worth could be expressed in dollars. Consequently, Paul D is very insecure about whether or not he could possibly be a real man, and he frequently wonders about his value as a person. Seth also was treated as a subhuman. She once walked in on a school teacher giving his pupils a lesson on her animal characteristics. She too seems to be alienated from herself and filled with self-loathing. Thus, she sees the best part of herself as her children. Yet her children also have volatile, unstable identities. Denver conflates her identity with Beloved's and Beloved feels herself actually beginning to physically disintegrate. Slavery has also limited Baby Sog's self-conception by shattering her family and denying her the opportunity to be a true wife, sister, daughter or loving mother. As a result of their inability to believe in their own existences, both Baby Suggs and Paul D become depressed and tired. While Baby Suggs' fatigue is spiritual, Paul D's is emotional. While a slave, Paul D developed self-defeating coping strategies to protect him from the emotional pain he was forced to endure. Any feelings he had were locked away in the rusted tobacco tin of his heart, and he concluded that one should love nothing too intensely. Other slaves went insane and thus suffered a complete loss of self. Seth fears that she too will end her days in madness. Indeed, she does prove to be mad when she kills her own daughter. Yet Seth's act of infanticide illuminates the perverse forces of the institution of slavery. Under slavery, a mother best expresses her love for her children by murdering them and thus protecting them from the more gradual destruction wrought by slavery. Stamp Bade muses that slavery's negative consequences are not limited to the slaves. He notes that slavery causes whites to become changed and altered, made bloody, silly, worse than they ever wanted to be. The insidious effects of the institution affect not only the identities of its black victims, but those of the whites who perpetrate it and the collective identity of Americans. 
Where slavery exists, everyone suffers a loss of humanity and compassion. For this reason, Morrison suggests that our nation's identity, like the novel's characters, must be healed. America's future depends on its understanding of the past. Just as Seth must come to terms with her past before she can secure a future with Denver and Paul D. Before we can address slavery's legacy and the contemporary problems of racial discrimination and discord, we must confront the dark and hidden corners of our history. Crucially in Beloved, we learn about the history and legacy of slavery not from school teachers or even from the Portwin's point of view, but rather from Seth's, Paul D's, Stamp Bates and Baby Suggs's. Morrison writes history with the voices of a people historically denied the power of language. And Beloved recuperates a history that had been lost, either due to willed forgetfulness or due to forced silence. The theme of solidarity. Beloved demonstrates the extent to which individuals need the support of their communities in order to survive. Seth first begins to develop her sense of self during her 28 days of freedom when she becomes a part of the Cincinnati community. Similarly, Denver discovers herself and grows up when she leaves 124 and becomes a part of society. Paul D. and his fellow prison inmates in Georgia prove able to escape only by working together. They are literally chained to one another and Paul D. recalls that if one lost, all lost. Lastly, it is the community that saves Seth from mistakenly killing Mr. Bodwin and casting the shadow of another sin across her and her family's life. Cincinnati's black community plays a pivotal role in the events of 124. The community's failure to alert Seth to school teachers' approach implicates it in the death of Seth's daughter. Baby Suggs feels a slight as a grave betrayal from which she never fully recovers. At the end of the novel, the black community makes up for its past misbehavior by gathering at 124 to collectively exercise Beloved. By driving Beloved away, the community secures sets and its own release from the past. About the author, Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison, original name, Chloe Anthony Wofford, born February 18, 1931, Ohio, United States, died August 5, 2019, New York, was an American writer noted for her examination of black experience particularly black female experience within the black community. She received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993. Morrison grew up in the American Midwest in a family that possessed an intense love of and appreciation for black culture. Storytelling, songs and folk tales were a deeply formative part of her childhood. She attended Howard University for her bachelor's in 1953 and Cornell University for her master's in 1955. After teaching at Texas Southern University for two years, she taught at Howard from 1957 to 64. In 1965, Morrison became a fiction editor at Random House, where she worked for a number of years. In 1984, she began teaching writing at the State University of New York at Albany, which she left in 1989 to join the faculty of Princeton University. She retired in 2006. Morrison's first book, The Bluest Eye, published 1970, is a novel of initiation concerning a victimized adolescent black girl who is obsessed by white standards of beauty and longs to have blue eyes. In 1973, a second novel, Sula, was published. It examines, among other issues, the dynamics of friendship and the expectations for conformity within the community. Songs of Solomon, published 1977, is told by a male narrator in search of his identity. Its publication brought Morrison to national attention. Tar Baby, published 1981, set on a Caribbean island, explores conflicts of race, class and sex. The critically acclaimed Beloved, published in 1987, which won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, is based on the true story of a runaway slave who at the point of recapture kills her infant daughter in order to spare her a life of slavery. A film adaptation of the novel was released in 1998 and starred Oprah Winfrey. In addition, Morrison wrote the libretto for Margaret Garner in 2005, an opera about the same story that inspired Beloved. In 1992, Morrison released Jazz, a story of violence and passion 
set in New York City's Harlem during the 1920s. Subsequent novels were Paradise, published in 1998, a richly detailed portrait of a black utopian community in Oklahoma, and Love, published in 2003, an intricate family story that reveals the myriad facets of love and its ostensible opposite. A Mercy, in 2008, deals with slavery in 17th century America. In The Redemptive Home, published in 2012, a traumatized Korean War veteran encounters racism after returning home and later overcomes apathy to rescue his sister. In God Help the Child, published in 2015, Morrison chronicled the ramifications of child abuse and neglect through the tale of Bride, a black girl with dark skin who is born to light-skinned parents. A work of criticism, Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and Literary Imagination was published in 1992. Many of Morrison's essays and speeches were collected in What Moves at the Margin, Selected Nonfiction, published in 2008, and The Source of Self-Regard, Selected Essays, Speeches and Meditations, published in 2019. She and her son, Slade Morrison, co-wrote a number of children's books, including The Who's Got Game series, The Book About Mean People, published 2002, and Please, Louise, published 2014. She also penned Remember in 2004, which chronicles the hardships of black students during the integration of the American public school system aimed at children. It uses archival photographs juxtaposed with captions speculating on the thoughts of their subjects. For that work, Morrison won the Coretta Scott King Award in 2005. The central theme of Morrison's novels is the black American experience in an unjust society. Her characters struggle to find themselves and their cultural identity. Her use of fantasy, her sinuous poetic style, and a rich interweaving of the mythic gave her stories great strength and texture. In 2010, Morrison was made an officer of the French Legion of Honor. Two years later, she was awarded the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom. Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am 2019, is a documentary about her life and career. So that's all for now. If you found this video useful, we would really love it if you could give it a thumbs up. Also, do subscribe to our channel where we offer lots of free material that you can use as part of your studies to get a better understanding of specific areas that you might find challenging. Also, if you need more information, either on this novel or more generally for other areas in your course, make sure to visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There you will find useful revision guides, model answers and tools that you can use to get top marks in your coursework or exams. Thank you for listening.